Hi guys. So today what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at regression and also applications of quadratics. So using quadratic functions basically to be able to model some situations. So on this first one, uh, what the first thing we do is we're going to look at regression. Now you did regression back in Algebra 1. Uh, regression was when you found like the line of best fit for a scatter plot. So we can actually do more than just linear regression. We can, we can actually do regression for all sorts of different types of models depending on the kind of data that we have. Um, and we'll do a couple more throughout the year as well. So today we're going to look at quadratic regression. So we're going to look at data that's in that quadratic form. So if you look at the first one, it gives us a table of data and then it shows us a graph. So before we go into how to do this on the calculator, we're going to just review how we find this algebraically. Now in this case, we're just going to estimate. We're not going to be able to get this pretty exact. So we can either estimate using an estimate for the vertex in another point, or we can estimate using the roots. So I'm going to do the roots just because those are a little bit easier to see. So to find my roots and write an equation, it would be a times x minus r times x minus r. So the best estimates of my roots here would be 3 and 12. So now I just need to know what a is. Well, to know what a is, I would need to plug in some values for x and y. So I need to pick some point on this graph that would model this parabola well. So I'm just going to go with 528 just because that's an easy point to see what the values actually are. So I'm going to plug in 28 for y and 5 for x, and then solve. So I get that a is equal to negative 2. That means my equation would be negative 2 times x minus 3 times x minus 12. But if I want to write this in standard form, what I would need to do is actually FOIL out this whole thing. So this would be minus 15x plus 36. And then I could distribute that 2. And I get my equation. All right, so what we also can do is we can use regression in order to model this. So regression is going to be a little bit more exact. So what we're going to do in order to do regression is we're going to go to our calculators. And we're going to go to statistics on our calculator. All right, so from our calculator then, we are going to go to menu and statistics. And then we're going to enter the points that are in that table. So when we enter those points, our x's are going to go under list 1, and our y's are going to go to list 2. So once we have all those points entered, we can do a couple different things. If I already know this is quadratic, because I did already see the graph and I saw that that shape is quadratic, I can go ahead and immediately go to calc, and I can go to reg for regression, and then I can select x squared. And that is going to give me my regression equation. So then I would just fill in those values. So my aggression, regression equation here would be negative 1.56x squared plus 23x plus, or minus I should say, 51.58. And that would be my regression equation. All right, so from this point, um, let's say we didn't know what kind of model this was. And I wanted to look at the scatter plot. Well, what I could do to view that scatter plot, I'm just going to exit to go back to this main screen. I'm going to go to where it says graph. And then I'm going to do F1 again to get my graph. And then that gives me a scatter plot. So I can see what kind of data this is if I don't know. And that looks like um, a quadratic. So then I, from here, I can just go straight from the screen to find it. I would do calc. This looks like quadratic, so I'm going to do x squared, which is F4. And it gives me the same thing. But this gives me an additional option now of draw. So if I select draw, which is F6, then I can actually see that line modeled and I can see what, what kind of a fit it is. What I also can do, if you look at this R squared value, what that R squared value does, it tells us how good of a fit our line actually is. So the closer that number is to 1, the better fit this equation actually is. All right, so what we can also do, if you see where it says copy, if I press that, um, I'll press enter and I'll just press it one more time. And you'll see that what it's done actually is it's copied that equation into my graph. So now if I want to go to my graph, that equation has already been stored. So this is good in case I want to use that equation uh, to model some other things. And obviously I would need to change my window in order to do that. Uh, but that would allow me to see this um, on my graph and do some of the G-solve options. But again, my window would need to be changed in order to do that. 
All right, so we're gonna look at another example here. Um, so what I would do here, uh, this wants me, it gives me some data about a traffic study. So at every 10 minute interval, it's recording the number of cars, but it's showing the number of car, cars um, in relation to the maximum amount. So for example, if you see negative 28, it doesn't mean there's negative 28 cars, it just means there's 28 less than the maximum that that road can withhold. So like at this point, there are 111 more than what the maximum of that road should be. So then what we would do is we would just create a scatter plot to see if this is quadratic data, which you can probably tell just from looking at the points, noticing that they're going up until they reach a certain point, and then they're going back down. But we could do that scatter plot, but then we're going to go ahead and do regression. So go ahead in your calculators, type these values in, put the x's in list 1, put the y's in list 2, and then find your equation. All right, so when I put this in my calculator and I do quadratic regression, if you looked at your scatter plot, you'd notice it was quadratic. So I would end up with negative 4.36x squared plus 45.58x minus 10.43. And that is my best model for that data. So we can also determine what kind of data we have from looking at a table. Um, and we can determine if this line is exactly going to be a quadratic model or a linear model. So how we can tell if it's a linear model, that's pretty simple. What we do is we look at how the x's are changing and the y's are changing. If our x's are changing by a constant amount each time, and our y's are also changing by a constant amount, then this would be a linear model because our x's and y's would have a, the consistent slope. So if I want to actually write this equation, I know the slope. That would be negative 3 over 10x. The y-intercept would be 15. But now we, what we need to figure out this next one, it's not going to be linear. So if you notice, your inputs, the x's, those are evenly spaced. So those are consistent. So now let's look at the y values. Well, this time, it's not consistent. So the next thing that we do to see what kind of a model it is, what we can do is we can check not just that difference, we can check what's called the second difference. And what that means is we just see going from negative 2 to 2, well, that was up 4. From negative 2 to 6, from 6 to 10, from 10 to 14. So the second difference here is equally spaced. And if that's the case, that would tell us that that is quadratic. We also could find a quadratic model for this. Um, if I didn't know the vertex, I could use what we've done in previous lessons where I would set up that system of equations with ax squared plus bx plus c, and I could fill in those three points to get that data. But this one's a little bit easier because I know the y-intercept and I know the vertex. So if you notice, after 0, both to the left and the right, it's going up. So 0, 0 is going to be my vertex. Then, because it goes through 2, 2 and negative 2, 2, we know that normally the parent function goes through 2, 4 and negative 2, 4, which means that this graph has actually been compressed by a factor of 1 half. All right, so let's look at one more example. So this is one that you guys looked at on Pear Deck. Again, our x's are consistent. I look at my first differences. Well, this is plus 7, plus 9, 11, and 13. So the first differences don't work. But if I look at my second differences, those are consistent. Those are going up by 2 each time, which means that, yes, this does represent quadratic data. So one way that you could find this equation, again, we could use some of the similar methods where we find our points, we write our equation, we set up our system. But if you also can notice about this, these numbers, so what you'll notice about these y values is these y values are all pretty close to some of your perfect squares. So like 9, 16, 25, 36, and 49. It's just one up from that amount. But what you'll also realize in order to get that 9, okay, I would need to take that x value and change it. So what I could do is I could take that x value, I could add 3, and square it, and that would give me 1 short of the perfect square, so then after that I would add 1. Well now, that data is in vertex form if I wanted to model it. So that's just another way just to look at these questions. All right, so now we're going to look at projectile motion, and I will tell you this is really important. There's a mistake. Um, I left off a T on your notes, so your velocity needs to get multiplied by T as well. I apologize, I left it off when I was typing them up. 
All right, so the first one, it says an example, it says a bird drops a fish from a height of 150. So if we are dropping an object, we do not need to consider velocity because it's just being dropped, it's not being thrown. Um, then we need to consider, are we talking about feet or meters? So in this problem, we're using feet. So our equation is going to be negative 16t squared. The reason it's negative 16 is because gravity would be 32 feet per second, and it's negative 1 half at in that equation. So the height of my fish, I would do h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 150. Then I can use this model to answer any questions that go with this problem. So for example, this next one, it says use your model to determine how long the fish is in the air. Well, the fish will no longer be in the air when the height is zero. So if I plug in zero, I could then solve this equation. When I solve it, I'll get two possibilities, both a positive and a negative, but the negative doesn't really make sense for my problem. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to graph this. All right, so once I have that equation plugged into my graph, um, I'm going to go ahead and graph it, but you'll notice your window is not going to be quite right. Um, so I'm going to need to adjust this window. Now, sometimes I know you guys will go to zoom and you'll try auto. Well, that will show me the curve. It doesn't really help for the problem that I have. Um, so I need to consider the problem that I'm working with. So let's go to my window, which is F3. So X is our time. So the time that the fish is in the air, we're going to start with an X min of zero. X max, our biggest X max would be how long that fish is in the air. And we can kind of estimate here and just see if it works. I'm going to start with five. Y min is our smallest Y value, which we're going to leave at zero, because once it's negative, it doesn't really relate to our problem anymore. Then the max is our height. So it starts at the height of 150. So my window has to go at least that high to be able to see the maximum. So now I can graph this, and there's my function. So then from this point, to answer the question I was talking about, I wanted to know when the fish is no longer in the air and how long that took. So I'm going to go to G solve, and I'm going to do root because the root, it would be when y is zero. That gives me an x value of 3.06. So it would take 3.06 seconds, uh, basically, for that fish to hit back in the water. All right, so now let's look at our next question. Very similar, except this time, the bird comes back for the fish, and this time the fish is jumping. All right, so the fish is jumping straight up um, from a height of three feet, at a velocity of four feet per second. So that is going to change my equation. So my equation is gonna be this time, it's still negative 16 t squared, but since I have a velocity now, it's gonna be plus four t, then plus three. So now I'm gonna use this model to answer the next couple of questions. So if I wanna determine the maximum height and the, number, the amount of seconds it takes to reach that, algebraically, negative b over 2a would give us the x value. The x value would, in this case, be the time. I would then plug that x value in in order to get the maximum height. The other option is I can graph this and find the maximum. So let's go ahead and graph this equation. All right, so there's my function. I'm going to graph it, and you'll notice your window does not look right. So this time on our window, you notice that the fish is jumping much not as high in the air. So I'm going to go back to my window. My time is a little bit shorter. If I want to edit that, I can. But my biggest issue to change is the Y max. So because that fish is not jumping up very high, I'm going to make that Y max a lot smaller. And now I can see that picture a lot more clearly. So since I want the maximum height, I'm going to go to G solve. I'm going to do F2, which is max. So the maximum height would be the Y coordinate. So when you're answering these questions, make sure you keep the X and Y coordinates straight. X coordinate is the time, the Y coordinate is the height in feet. So the maximum height is 3.25 feet. The time it takes to reach that height would be the X coordinate, which is 0.125 seconds. And don't forget to use your units whenever you're working out these problems. All right, so we do need to make sure we're listing feet or seconds or miles or meters or whatever it is that we're using. All right, so then the next question, uh, same problem. It says how long the fish is in the air. So very similar, G solve and root. So that would take 0.57, I think that looks like a 5. So let's say 0.58 seconds uh, for that fish to go back in the water. All right, so the last one's a little bit different. This last one actually gives me the equation. So we don't have to write the equation this time. So it says x is the horizontal distance, y is the height in feet. 
So different this time because it's actually going to show the path of the ball, whereas the last two equations we did, x was time and y was height. So this time, because the ball is actually going out, we are modeling the path using this equation. So we're going to go ahead and graph it. So once your equation's in, you can go ahead and graph it. And again, we're going to need to change our window a lot this time. So we'll go to our window. So this time, since x is not time, x is horizontal distance, that's going to be a lot bigger. So let's try something like 300. All right, then look at our height. Okay, our height is going to need to be bigger. Let's try something like 100. And let's see what our graph looks like. So you'll notice my distance horizontally looks pretty good now, but my vertical height does not look right. So I'm gonna go back to my window and I'm gonna make that Y max taller. So let's go ahead and make our Y max like 250. And that gives us a very good picture of our graph. So now we can use this model to answer our questions. So first question was what's the maximum height of the baseball? So G solve max. So remember X is the horizontal distance y is our height. So the maximum height would be 228 feet. Question two wants to know how far the baseball travels. So we're going to go g solve and root. And you'll notice this time it tells us it's not found. The reason for that, even though our picture looks pretty good, it actually doesn't quite get to that root. So if your root is not within your window, it's going to give you an error. And we need to change our window to make it a little bit larger. So I'm going to make my window 305. So now when I go G solve and root, it's going to give me that value, which is actually 301 feet. All right, so that is the height, that's how far that ball travels. Then the last question tells us there's a fence that is five feet tall, 300 feet away from where the ball is hit. We want to know if the baseball is going to hit the fence. So what we need to do is we need to determine the height of the baseball when X is equal to 300. So on the calculator, what we can do is we can go to G solve. And then I can go over here to this next one. And then what I want to do here, since I'm, I know an X and I want to know the Y that goes with it, I'm going to do Y cal. So it says to enter my X value. The fence is 300 feet away, so I'm going to do X is 300. Well, after 300 feet, the ball has a height of 3 feet. Since the fence was 5 feet tall, this is not going to clear the fence. It's going to hit it almost in the middle. So the baseball would not clear the fence. All right, there's one last question that actually was not on the notes that I want to add, and that would be, what would we do, um, how would we determine when is the baseball 100 feet off the ground? All right, so a little bit similar to the last question, just different. So we want to know when it's 100 feet off the ground. Well, 100 is equal to my equation, which was the 0.01x squared. So I could solve that algebraically, or again, I could use my calculator in two different ways. So one option is I could go to G-solve, and this time since I know the y and I'm looking for the x's, I could do x-cal. So I would plug in the y value that I know, which is 100, and that tells me that it would happen when x is equal to negative, or x is equal to 36.86. Now the problem with this method that you may miss, it wants to know whenever the ball is 100 feet off the ground, this is not the only location. The ball is also 100 feet over the ground over here. So you can go left and right to determine if there's more than one of those areas. We just need to be careful of that. Uh, because that can be hard to tell, what I like to do instead to solve these problems, and if you're using a TI uh, 83 or 84, you'll probably have to do it this way. I'm going to plug in my Y value into Y2. So I want to know when the height is 100. Well, where it intersects, that's the place where it's happening. So then I can do G-solve, and I can do intersect. So there's one of my intersections, and there's my other intersection. So it gives me the same values, but what I like about this is it gives you a very clear visual of where it's actually crossing, so you can see that there are two places. All right, so that is it for today with modeling and regression, and then we will start a new unit soon.